Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I read a really fascinating article in the newspaper about a, um, a discovery of some, I think they're tails or something like that, coming out of the Milky Way, ribbons, I think they were called, and, uh, and they were made by an assistant professor at uh, the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at University of Toronto. Uh, she's also a uh, associate faculty member of the Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto. Her name is Ting Lee, and uh, it also was suggesting that these ribbons indicated that, that there's black holes at the middle of the Milky Way. So I want to introduce you to Ting Lee, Professor, Assistant Professor Ting Lee of the Department of Astrono Astronomy and Astrophysics. Uh, can I call you Professor Lee? Oh, Ting, either is fine. Okay, Ting, welcome to the show. So tell me, what was this discovery? Um, is it ribbons that are coming out of the Milky Way or something? Uh, so these are ribbon-like stellar structure, I would call. So it's basically many group of stars moving in a coherent way on the sky that when we observe them, astronomers observe them, and they are originated, originated from the uh, Milky Way's companion. So I'm not sure if you know, but uh, Milky Way has a lot of small satellite galaxies or globular clusters orbiting around the Milky Way. So if you have ever a chance to go to the Southern Hemisphere, for example, you will be able to see, for example, the large and uh, small Magellanic cloud. So um, in what you are showing here, if you scroll down a little bit for the second image, that's the map of the Milky Way. So you can see two bright galaxies there in the like the middle to towards the uh, right. I'm not sure if I can, let's see. So these two, so these are the two very famous satellite galaxy of our Milky Way. These are the large and the small magellanic cloud. So our Milky Way has a lot of these satellite galaxies orbiting around us. So the Milky Way has satellite galaxies orbiting around it. Right. That's really? the first thing. And also there's a small dot here. You probably cannot see uh, very well. Let me show uh, here. A small dot in the middle of the Milky Way? No, no, not those. Those. This is the plane of the Milky Way. So the, ga the Milky Way, the, ga the disk of the Milky Way. But you can see maybe like this one. I'm not sure if you can see it. And yeah. maybe this one. So these things is not a star. Well, it's so small. So you see like a point source. But these are another type of like satellites or we call like companion of the Milky Way. These are the globular clusters. So you may, may have heard of things like Massier 2 globular cluster. So those are the globular clusters also orbiting around the Milky Way. And so both these satellite galaxies and these globular clusters, they are the companion of the Milky Way. And some of these, when they get closer to the Milky Way because of the gravity, the gravitational field of the Milky Way, the, the Milky Way can tore these apart. And then they form these kind of ribbon-like structure in terms of their, their, like their structure, the shape on the sky. But it's really a group of stars all originate from either one particular galaxy or one particular globular cluster. And all these stars move together. And these are the things that we are talking about in this paper. So in this work, we mapped 12 of these and we call them stellar stream because it's like a river on the sky. That's why we call them stellar stream. That's how this work come from. But these are just really made of a group of stars moving together. Uh, if they didn't get tidally disrupted by the Milky Way, then they should be a galaxy, an intact galaxy or intact globular cluster. But some of these get tidal disrupted by the Milky Way. And not to mention, this is how Milky Way kind of grow bigger and bigger. So we know, we learn, astronomer, we learn that the, the, the galaxy grow bigger and bigger by merging with other neighboring galaxies. So this is what we say like, oh, the Milky Way eating these small galaxies and then become fatter and fatter. I mean, it's really being massive. This is fascinating. Yeah. So you're saying the Milky Way is actually growing in size? Uh, over time, I mean, over the past, I would say like, say, Eight billion years, it definitely grow. And not only Milky Way, all the galaxies are big, big, getting bigger and bigger. And in a few more, get, I don't remember exact the time, but I'm not sure if you heard. Like our Milky Way will also merge with the M31, so and become a much bigger galaxy eventually in the future. But that will be many billion years later. So probably there won't be human being at that time. But the point I want to say is the small galaxies. 
uh, like merge together, make bigger galaxies. And our Milky Way is already a pretty big galaxy. It kind of eats surrounding globular clusters and satellite galaxies companion and make become bigger and bigger. And this one of the study we wanted to do with, with this work is to understand like what kind of thing Milky Way eats, right? What kind of thing Milky Way not uh, like, um, so right now we see these stars as still a ribbon-like structure, but after a few more billion years, these, these stars will become speared out and be part of the Milky Way, fully become part of Milky Way. You cannot distinguish like on the sky anymore because there's no such structure anymore. It's, it's a time, it's, it's, it's change over time. But we are seeing like at this particular time, these streams formed from the disrupted globular cluster or satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. And then finally, eventually become part of the Milky Way after another a few billion years, if that makes sense. Fascinating. We're chatting tonight with uh, Assistant Professor Ting Li uh, at the uh, Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with uh, Professor uh, Li in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio while we're on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight about the Milky Way and uh, some ribbons that uh, have been found by an assistant professor at the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto that, that sort of spread out from the Milky Way. And it's fascinating because um, what uh, this assistant professor is suggesting is that uh, the Milky Way is sort of eating up other galaxies and these ribbons of, of stars that come out of the Milky Way will eventually become part of the, the Milky Way. Um, and uh, I, I wanna introduce you again to uh, assistant professor Ting Li um, at the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. Before joining the University of Toronto in 2021, she was the 2019 NASA Hubble Fellow at Carnegie Observatories with a joint appointment uh, in the Department of Astrophysical Sciences at Princeton University as a Carnegie Princeton Fellow. She was also a Leon Ledman Fellow at the Furman Center for Particle Astrophysics from 2016 to 2019. She got her PhD at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Texas A&M University. She received the Ameris Mundus Scholarship for Joint European Master in Space Science and Technology, uh, during which she stayed in Germany, Sweden, France, and Japan for six months each. She completed her undergraduate university uh, studies at Fudan University in Shanghai, China with a major in physics and a minor in diplomacy. My God, you got a great educational background. Thank you. Yeah, it was a fun journey. I can imagine. I actually uh, had uh, six weeks at uh, Fudan University uh, in Shanghai oh. where I was taking business courses. So I didn't uh, do anything that? like you, but I really enjoyed uh, my time in Shanghai and uh, Fudan University, which is sort of what northeast of the downtown of Shanghai, correct? Yeah. Excellent. And uh, we're very lucky to have you here in, uh, in Toronto, at the University of Toronto. So tell me, let's take a step back. What, what's, the, what's the meaning of this? What, like obviously, these ribbons are fascinating, but what do you think, what, what's the key to this? What have we found? Is it something about black holes or is it something about galaxies um, growing? What, what's, this, what's the key to this uh, uh, finding? Sure. So... Um... I think there are two uh, implications for our of our work. One is, as was I said, we are always we as as someone living inside Milky Way, right? We always keen to know like how Milky Way was formed. For example, did it once uh, like bring in or eat a big group of galaxies altogether, a very massive one of a very uh, of a bunch of small ones? So we want to know the formation history of our Milky Way and how it get to at this stage now we are seeing. So we wanted to understand the feeding habits of the Milky Way, like see what kind of thing eat. For example, whether these ribbon structure on the sky, they are actually a satellite galaxy or they are a global cluster that- Sorry, what, what's this? I don't understand the second word, global cluster? Globular cluster. So globular star cluster. cluster. Yeah, because they are spheres, so we call them globular cluster, but it's also star cluster is the other word. So star I can cluster. show maybe a- Tell me what is a, uh, a, a globular cluster? Sure, I can share my screen maybe. Yep. So what's a globular cluster? So I, uh, can you, where, do you see my screen? Let me try this yes. again. Yes, okay. So this is a globular cluster for a particular those dots. So I showed, I said those dots there. Yep. These are just a group of stars. So 
this uh, group of star because of gravity, they they uh, um, they form a group of stars. They have like probably thousands to millions of stars or orbiting each other from thousands to millions of stars. Right. That orbit each other. Right. Really? And then they are also orbiting around the center of the Milky Way. So these are the companions. So so how so, many how many stars are in the Milky Way? Oh, too many. I don't think uh, uh, billions of billions. I, I don't think it's easy. Billions of billions of stars in the Milky Way. Really? Right. And, 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 and you say there that are... there's a center to the Milky Way that it, it orbits around. What is the center of the Milky Way? Is that a black hole? Uh, so, the, uh, so there are studies about uh, whether the, the center of the Milky Way has a black hole there. And I think we, we nowadays we know, like uh, we confirm there is a black hole there and we know the mass of the black hole there. But uh, there are also discussion whether there's a, another different mass of black hole there. There's also the, the studies like that. So we don't know exactly what's at the center of the Milky Way. Uh, I think we are pretty clear there is a black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Uh, I think that's that's around something like a four, five million solar mass. So that's uh, undoubted. Um, I guess the question is whether there is another smaller, like medium mass black hole there together interacting. I think there are studies about those kind of things. Okay. And so um, these ribbons are not part of the Milky Way as of yet. Is that correct? Uh, so, so they are not part of the Milky Way, the uh, the disk, I would say, but they are in in terms of the the gravitational potential. They are inside the Milky Way, and the Milky Way has something we call halo. So there's a lot of stars also, not only in the disk but also above and below the Milky Way disk. So those there are field stars in the Milky Way, and I would say these streams are currently in the gravitational potential of the Milky Way. So if we can we consider everything within the Milky Way's uh, potential, then they are part of the Milky Way, right? But themselves, they are also a system all moving together. If that makes sense. They're part of it. So it would be like what, comets or meteors that are rotating around planets? Mm, I'm not sure if that's a good analog. Um, Let's see. Yeah, you can maybe think in that way. It's like, uh, well, I don't. I never thought about to think about this with solar system, honestly. Okay. But That's I right. guess location-wise, they are part of the Milky Way because they are in Milky Way's potential. But they also moving all together. It's not randomly moving. Um, they all moving together. That's why we think they are still a system by itself. But it's right. also within the Milky Way's. Uh, gravity. So uh, so is the Milky Way a galaxy or are there numerous galaxies in the Milky Way? Oh, there's Milky Way is one galaxy has numerous stars there, right? Millions of stars in the Milky Way. Okay. And but so how many there are a lot of there are a lot of galaxy okay. And but then there's a lot of small galaxies surrounding the Milky Way. So those are like as I mentioned earlier. So this is the I think this is the image I showed earlier. So this is the two satellite galaxies. So themselves are self-bound, but they are orbiting around the Milky Way. So they're part of the Milky it's Way. Like, okay, I, I think I find a good way to say this. Uh, let me see if this is a way. So our well, like they are like the moon, right? We call them satellite. They are like moon orbiting the the earth right okay and so what what do you think that the significance of these ribbons is that you found yeah so one thing as i said it's good for us to learn about the formation of the milky way and another thing is about uh, dark matter so you earlier say the black hole in the center so we are not very sensitive to that but uh, here is another movie i would like to show so what you are seeing in this movie okay the black ones, oh sorry, not the the green ones are these star clusters that are what I mentioned. And originally they are intact. So they are bound to themselves and they are orbiting around the Milky Way. But as I mentioned earlier, as a bit closer and closer to the Milky Way's center, they get tidal disrupted and form these kind of ribbon structure. The white, oh, sorry, the, the, the red, 
dots here, these are invisible dark matter. So they are not, this is a simulation, so astronomer simulation. But the idea is the green par particles are visible matter, like in a star cluster. Uh, the red dots here are invisible matter, so you cannot see them, they are dark matter. And the idea is we look at the distribution in, in the location and the motion for the, these green particles here, these visible matter. We try to map the underlying distribution of invisible dark matter. So we'll be able to use these stars in this ribbon structure to map what is the underlying distribution of the dark matter in our Milky Way. And that's a big work that we wanted to do. And that will tell us like what's the nature of, of let me stop in this. Um, and so what you're saying is that the dark matter and the gravitational pull of the dark matter is in a in a certain way um, changing the composition of these these stars and making it into a longer ribbon, and that teaches you something about the gravitational pull and the location of that dark matter. Is that correct? You can think of that way. So yeah, the the gravity of the Milky Way changes the distribution of these stars, and. Uh, depending on what the, the mass of the Milky Way, that what total mass of dark matter in the Milky Way and how they distribute, it may result a different uh, distribution of these stars in this ribbon and their velocity. And that's why we measure these, we try to, to understand this. And I, I can give you a kind of a maybe easy way to understand. For example, we just had Christmas a few weeks ago. So if you see those Christmas tree, right, in a dark night, if you don't turn on lights, it's dark. You won't be able to see it. It's like our dark matter in the Milky Way. You don't see the dark matter directly. But you have these twinkle lights, like a stripe of lights um, wrapped around the, the tree. And uh, when you turn on the light, these are like the stream, the stars in these stellar streams, the ribbon structure. So we look at those, those, those lights, and we like look at the stream, we will be able to see the shape of the tree. So we don't see the dark matter directly, but we use the the, the stream to see the map to map the, the distribution of the dark matter. That's and a great you analogy. probably sometimes want more, more lights the more you have, right, the better you can see the shape. So we need a lot of these kind of streams um, to map the distribution of our Milky Way. So this is what we want to do. So this time we reported uh, observation of 12 stellar streams that in our Milky Way. We wanted to use a sample of many stellar streams in our Milky Way to get a good map of the dark matter distribution of our Milky Way, if that makes sense. I think that's a, probably a good way to analyze. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great analogy. But the other thing that I think is interesting that I didn't realize is these stellar streams or these stars are obviously orbiting um, in sort of very irregular uh, orbits around uh, the dark matter. Is that correct? So it's orbiting around because of the potential of the Milky Way, the gravity, right? And the Milky Way's gravity is coming from both the visible matter and dark matter. And the dark matter are dominate actually. Um, so we the, the idea is we can use stream to measure the distribution of the, the dark matter in our Milky Way. Like for example, like how massive it is, how it distributes as a function from the center of the galaxy to the edge of the galaxy, et cetera. So what is dark matter? We don't know the answer. That's why we are trying to study. I think gravitationally, astronomer has proved that dark matter exists for many decades. Uh, the way how we did that is, for example, we use some stars orbiting around a galaxy. We measure the motion of the star based on like some uh, physics, Einstein's physics. Um, we can kind of infer how many matter should be inside that circle that the star is orbiting, for example. And when we go measure the light coming from the galaxy, we find that the light coming from the galaxy is much lower than what the gravity says. So basically dark matter for us as astronomer are something we see them gravitationally. We know they have a gravity, they have mass, but when we look at the light emitted from them, we don't see that. So we don't know, or that's why we call them dark, dark matter, but we don't know the nature, what they are yet. And, and I think we are trying to figure out that. And one of these work is trying to understand the nature of dark matter and their different dark matter model predicts what is a dark matter distribution inside our Milky Way. And we're trying to use these ribbons of uh, stellar structure 
to kind of map the distribution of uh, dark matter in our Milky Way, which will infer, say, what dark matter model that theorists predict, like proposed, are much be be better fit to our observational data. If that makes sense, and uh, hopefully we will be able to answer that in a few years or decade. But uh, so far, uh, I think we know dark matter exists, but we don't really know particle nature of dark matter. So is dark matter matter a black hole? Is that are those two terms uh, the same? Mm, so dark a black hole, or there's a more better word called a primordial black hole, is a I would say possible candidate, and that's also active research area. Uh, but uh, the like the black hole in our Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way, or black hole from like a death or explosion of this after explosion of a massive star, this kind of black hole is not the dark matter we are talking about. These are just a very massive but a very high density this normal matter, not dark matter, normal matter, that's so massive that it doesn't, they don't emit light. So those are normal matter. Those are not the dark matter we are talking about here. Fascinating. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Professor Lee in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crabby Radio Bar on Sagan and 60. I'm having a lot of fun uh, chatting with Ting Li. She is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And she's been telling us a little bit about um, these ribbons that come out of the Milky Way that are telling us a little bit about how the Milky Way is growing over time and also about the dark matter that's at the, uh, at the, at the middle of uh, the Milky Way, I guess. Um, she's an observational astrophysicist working on near-field cosmo cosmology, galactical archaeology, and metal poor stars. That'll be interesting. I'm going to have to ask you what metal poor stars are. Um, her main interest is to study the Milky Way and use that to understand the formation history of the Milky Way and the nature of dark matter. In particular, she studies interesting substructures in our local universe, including stellar streams and dwarf galaxies with modern imaging surveys, such as the Dark Energy Survey. After finding them, she follows up uh, the stars and the streams and the galaxies to study their kinematic and chemical properties using large optical telescopes all over the world. In the summer of 2018, she initiated the Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscopic Survey, or S5, to map the kinetics, uh, kinematics, and chemistry of stellar streams in the Southern Hemisphere. She was the convener of the DES Milky Way Working Group in 2018 and 2020. Fascinating. And you also did a minor in diplomacy and a major in physics. How did you go from diplomacy to physics to astrophysics? Uh, so I wanted to do astrophysics at the beginning when I was a kid. I really wanted to learn astronomy, like how the universe evolves, those kind of things. But at, at that time, I think the university is in Shanghai doesn't really have any astronomy major or astrophysics major. So I end up take a physics major for my undergrad. And then during my PhD, I did my research on astrophysics. In terms of the diplomacy, yeah. So, I mean, at that time, I think a lot of, of student takes like computer science or what other things like math as their second major or minor. And I decided to do something totally different. And I'm always interested in like international relations. And also I feel like physics, like a lot of things in really space is all connect to like international security, all of those stuff. So I just wanted to get more kind of, I would say knowledge and learning different things. And uh, um, at that time, Fudan University had a um, diplomacy a minor is a new program, so I decided to take it. And a very surprising, like, I think I remember among the 20 students in that minor program, uh, or second major program, um, almost all of them is like, uh, uh, their primary major is on like a language, like French, or I think I'm the only kind of science student, but it's still fun kind of um, uh, to have that experience. When and how did you find your way to the University of Toronto? Oh, so yeah, so I, I did my PhD and also my first postdoc in um, first uh, the two postdoc actually in US. Uh, but I did a lot of uh, several visit um, during actually both during my PhD time and also my graduate student time. Oh, uh, sorry, my PhD time and my postdoc period. Uh, 
I really like the city, the Toronto. I think it's just a, I love, I, well, I'm not sure. I'm a foodie and I really like that the Chinatown is so close to the university. I think that's a big plus. And the university has a great astronomy program. Like they have everything like from exoplanet study to like what I do, like Milky Way galaxies of the way to like cosmology. And uh, they also have uh, people doing observational astronomy, the people building instruments. So it's very comprehensive, I would say, um, covers a lot of uh, a wide range in astronomy. And there's a lot of good, great people here. So I decided uh, uh, to accept the offer when I was offered to, to, um, to be an assistant professor here. And actually I just joined last summer. So I just got here, yeah, half a year ago during the pandemic, moving from US to, to Toronto. Well, we're glad you did. Tell us uh, about some of these uh, terms. Uh, what is near field cosmology? Sure. So cos I'm not sure. If, um, first of all, cosmology is also probably a term. That's what we use to study the, I would say the origin, like where um, the, like about people talk about like Big Bang, if you've heard like the evolution over time and the ultimate fate of universe. That's what I say cosmology is. And the near field is more, a kind of a new invented field because people, a lot of people, when they do cosmology, you might heard people working on, for example, something related to like dark energy, uh, what, what they use galaxies in very far universe to measure the motion of the galaxies, um, I would say the redshift and the, the, the distance to those galaxies to understand the expansion history of the universe. That's what usually when people talk about cosmology. However, what I'm interested in to use stars in our own Milky Way or nearby galaxy, like those ribbons of stars or stars in a galaxy, a, a companion of our Milky Way galaxy. Um, we use those to study also the formation uh, to understand the, the formation of the universe. I think there are different ways. For example, I mentioned, we can use these to understand the nature of dark matter. So to understand what dark matter is. And also we look at these, some old, very, I think there's another word you might ask is metal pool star. So we look at these stars and I will explain in a second what those stars what, what, what metal pole star is. We use those stars to understand also the formation of the universe. And that's why we call this near field compared to the far field that people look at like high redshift stars that are on the star galaxies are a few billion years away from us. We are looking at things like, uh, um, yeah, much closer and in our like Milky Way neighborhood. It's still very far. It's um, a few hundred south, a few hundred, let me see a few hundred thousand light years. So it's still not that that close. It's not like solar neighborhood, right? But it is compared to the to the, the people who study far away galaxies, it's it's the it's a near field. That's why we call it near field cosmology. And okay. I want to get to this this um metal poor star uh if if you don't mind because it's yes, connected please. This near field. So first, you need to know what metal means for astronomer. So astronomer call everything not hydrogen or helium metal because hydrogen and helium are the two elements. I would say ninety nine percent of or more than ninety nine percent actually um, of the of the gas uh, of the element right after the Big Bang is hydrogen and helium, and all the other elements that we see nowadays are formed after that. Some through star, uh, like forming in, in, inside the star, some formed in other different ways. You might heard about like gravitational wave last a few years ago. And uh, these are coming from like uh, the, the neutron star, neutron star merger. So there are different ways forming this element. But anyway, the, the point I wanna say is metal, er everything other than uh, hydrogen and helium are what we call metal in astronomy. And then the next thing is because at the very beginning of the universe, right, there's only hydrogen and helium. So there's almost no metal. And um, nowadays we have several epoch of formation of stars. So star will form a gas clap, form a star. And then at some point it's, it, it explodes and then spill out the material and then to another gas. And then another gas can condense and form another star. So there are several kind of these epoch of star formation. And so the star form nowadays gets more metal rich 
then the star was formed a long time ago, if that makes sense. So when we talk about we study metal poor star, we really study the star that were formed long, long time ago that when there's not much metal in our universe. So that's another way, way why we think that uh, near field cosmology is interesting. So although we are studying something very nearby, but because we're studying these very old metal pool star, we are essentially probing the beginning of the universe. So we are probing something nearby, but was long time ago. So it's very similar to the time that the people, for example, JWST just launched, it will probe something at the very beginning of the universe. In terms of distance, those things are far away. And because, I mean, telescope is a time machine. So we, when we look far away, we look back in time, right? And so JWST is going to see something at right beginning, uh, right after the Big Bang or very close to that time. While we only see things nowadays because it's near field, however, because these stars were formed a long time ago, so they are falsely record of the of the of the universe after the Big Bang, so we can use those to study the universe, and that's why we call them near field cosmology. If that makes sense. So this is fascinating. What you're saying is that stars form over time, and that there's stars that have formed more recently that are metal rich versus stars that formed uh, right after the Big Bang that are metal poor. How do stars form more recently? So the star formed from like a group of gas because of gravity and then get basically denser and denser and then trigger the star formation and start to turning hydrogen into helium. So that's how the star was start to form and then emit lights. That's how the star formed. And at a certain point, um, the star will evolve and then at some point it will uh, explode. So you might heard of things called like supernova. So that's one type like one a death phase of one type of star at certain mass range because star has different range of mass and the supernova will explode and then spill out all of those different elements that were formed in in that originally star original star and then that element will maybe goes to an, pollute another cloud, a gas cloud, and that gas cloud a few years or million years later will condense and because of gravity, it's gonna shrink again, uh, smaller and smaller, and then trigger another star formation. And then another star, new star formed, if that makes sense. Really? So stars are forming all the time, breaking up and yeah, forming. Yeah, our Milky Way are still forming stars. So you see like the plane of the Milky Way, that's where a lot of gas are there and the forming stars actively. But the, the, the ribbon structure I'm talking about those, uh, because uh, they, they, these, these things, and also the, the global cluster that I talked about early, those are very old um, uh, stellar systems, and they are they don't have a rich gas there anymore, so they don't form star anymore. So what we are seeing from those structure are preserved basically uh, when the star were formed uh, several billion years ago. So those stars are very old and tell us about ancient universe. And the stars are now forming inside, say, our Milky Way, the plane, the disk of our Milky Way. Those are something just forming. And, um, and the star, yeah, I think on average, there's like one, oh, I forgot now, I, bear with me, but the, uh, uh, one star form per century, if that's the right word. Yeah, there will be one supernova explode per century at least. So, so I'm sure this is the active, yeah, active procedure that like they star form and die in our Milky Way uh, once in a while. Why is the Milky Way in a plane? Oh, because it's rotating, so it has the angular momentum. But although there are also, um, and uh, and then it's talk that's related to more like the. Uh, the, the 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 different type of of galaxies. So there are these kind of spiral galaxy like our Milky Way. There's also these kind of elliptical galaxies, more like a sphere or elliptical, uh, yeah, sphere. And uh, and these are different type. And our Milky Way because it ha it's 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 rotates. So basically everything collapse uh, to uh, one direction. So our, uh, this is Z direction and the Milky Way, the star rotate and then everything collapse into a thin disk. Really? Why would that happen versus a sphere? Mm. So 
that's um, so there are different type of galaxies at different stage. So our Milky Way is still a very young galaxy and that has some initial angular momentum. And then when the star form, it's just starting to get, um, it's another way to think about our, our solar system, for example. Yeah. If you look at the our sun, right? And all the small planets, right? Everything is orbiting roughly in a similar plane. There is some kind of angle, but it's all roughly in the same plane. And because there is, a, it's a total like angle momentum perpendicular to the solar system plane. But why? Why would it be in a plane rather than them going off in every direction? Because the initial condition there is a there is angle moment. If the if there's zero angle momentum, yeah, it can go any direction. But because there is a net angular momentum, and if you ask me why we had that from the start, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Okay, what is galactical? Archaeology. Yeah, so that's a kind of also newly invented word. So basically, it's like study the formation history of our Milky Way. And we kind of came up with this word archaeology because to mimic like uh, the archaeology in our life. But the, the way you can understand is, for example, the Milky Way has the disk, the Milky Way has the center we call bulge. There's like a bright uh, group of uh, star there, and then Milky Way has a lot of like less dense halo, what we call so. So the Milky Way has a has a spherical component. Yeah, so Milky Way has a lot of star in the disk. The Milky Way also has a has a spherical um, component, what we call the Milky Way halo. So Milky Way has different components, and we try to understand like the age distribution, the formation history, the evolution of the Milky Way. And that's what we call archaeology. Fascinating. You sound like you've got a pretty good job and you like it a lot. Sure, yeah. I think this is, well, I would say before pandemic, this is best job. I don't know if this too after pandemic will start because like, because I'm an observational astronomer, I spend usually at least, I would say three weeks a year to go to different observatory all over the world, like in Chile, in Hawaii, in Australia, to get these data, including the data I'm showing here. And right. also go to different conferences presenting the work. Now, all the observation become remote or some place shut down the telescope because of the COVID. And all the conference become um, uh, also remote. virtual. And um, we still do need to do all of the work at the university. So it's like, I feel like I'm observing during the night because observe, I mean, astronomer only observe when, when sun sets. And, uh, and then I need to teach during the day. It's much harder than it used to be, I would say. But uh, it is a great job. I agree on that. You're also very involved in building instruments, I understand. Yeah, it did some when I was a graduate student. Actually, I'm trying to, I'm applying for uh, uh, funds to, to build an instrumentation lab at the University of Toronto as well. So I'm interested in these kind of what we call astronomical surveys. So we build um, like instruments plus a program with a lot of infrastructure to scan the, the, the survey the sky in a more productive way. So instead of one person, well, I also do these kind of science, like I propose a science I wanna do. I know there is a telescope there already that can do my science, or I propose it. S5 is this kind of case. But also there's other mode, and now more and more popular in astronomy, where we, we want to do a dedicated survey. So we build an instrument on a telescope for like a five-year survey or 10-year survey to scan the sky, either doing an imaging or getting the spectra to get the different flux over a different color. But anyway, the idea is that we build infrastructure, hardware and software for these kind of survey and then use them to be more productively doing the science with, uh, with astronomic observations. So I'm I heavily involved in those kind of activities when I was a graduate student and also when I was a postdoc. And I hope I will continue to build a lab at uh, U of T to continue those kind of activities in the future. We're sharing tonight with uh, Assistant Professor um, of Astrophysics, uh, Ting Li, 
uh, astro astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Toronto about uh, some ribbons that she has found that come out of the Milky Way that uh, um, she says uh, indicate uh, where black matter is at the center of the Milky Way. We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga Night 60. We're chatting tonight with Ting Lee. She's an assistant professor at the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of uh, Toronto. She uh, um, announced uh, by way of, uh, I, I saw a press release and an article in the newspaper about ribbons that she found um, that were really attached to uh, the Milky Way galaxy and that uh, she's described as, uh, as galaxies that are associated with the Milky Way galaxy uh, but not part of the Milky Way galaxy as of yet. Um, but what they do as they as they orbit um, can actually show us where black matter is at the beginning, at the at the middle of the Milky Way. Uh, so it's absolutely fascinating and a real pleasure to uh, to chat with you tonight, um, uh, Professor Lee. What else is going on that you're really excited about um, that we're finding out in uh, in in your area? Sure. So I want to just to go back to so this work, what I was trying to show about these stellar streams, or you said the ribbon structure, these are coming from a collaboration I initiated in 2018 with an international team. So it's, stand, uh, it's called S5, stands for the Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscopic Survey. And uh, so uh, the, 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 the recent result is coming from uh, three years of observation from our survey. But I also want to say like our survey not only producing this stream related result, although that's what we originally planned for and that's what we have been doing. But uh, actually the most exciting result coming from S5 so far, I actually think is nothing related to, to Stellar Stream and I'm happy to share with you guys. So I can, um, yeah, so the story comes like this. After I think the first year of observing, uh, one of our collaborator, uh, my collaborator and the team member in S5 said, oh, he found a star is moving at a speed over a thousand kilometers per second from our data. And we don't believe that because most of the star that we have, we know in our Milky Way is moving around 200, um, like zero, between zero to about say 200 and maximum 300 kilometers per second. And it's very rare even for stars above 500 kilometers per second. And uh, this star at a thousand kilometers per second, over a thousand kilometers per second is fascinating. We didn't believe this result. So we had other collaborators try to observe it again over a different telescope using slightly different technique and we'll find exactly the same result. So we kind of confirmed that it is real and it's a star just moving super fast. And the more surprising because we know where it's moving so we can trace back its orbit and we find it's actually coming from the center of the Milky Way. And then we mentioned earlier that there is a black hole in the center of the Milky Way, right? So we were just curious, like what's happened. So I'm going to share my screen and show a movie. Uh, what's the best way to do that? So this is a star that's moving rapidly out of the center of the Milky Way. So it's a star is ejected from the center of the Milky Way and moving away from us at a speed of about 1700 kilometers per second. And I'm gonna share a screen to show you why that happened. So this is a pair of binary star. So a pair of a star, they orbit each other. Okay, that's what we think. And they get close to the center of the Milky Way. So that's a black hole in the center of the Milky Way. One get captured by the Milky Way uh, black hole there in the center. And the other one got ejected and uh, moving at an extremely high velocity. And this star, is moving at 1700 kilometers per second and will eventually leave Milky Way uh, galactic potential and never come back. And I think this is the fastest uh, hypervelocity star that has been found so far. And uh, it's very cool. It also provides us the hint to measure like the location of the black hole in the Milky Way, uh, in the center of the Milky Way, and also the mass of it, and also try to prove that the black hole actually is, is exists. So I think this is not something we expected when we start this survey. It's, uh, it's, it's not our main science goal, but this is a great discovery and I want to share with you guys for the story and want to, to know often astronomer or scientists to go looking for something and we always find a lot of cool stuff in our in our universe. 
Well, this has been a very cool discussion. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and telling us about your uh, your ribbons that come out of the Milky Way and about this star that's traveling at, you said, 1,700 kilometers, kilometers a second, second, when mm -hmm. most are between zero and 500 kilometers a second. I was a zero to 200 at the most. 500 is already quite unusual. So this is really going fast. Yeah. So the next one we know faster, uh, like faster than 500, I think it's like 800 or something. And this one is just double the next fastest type stars. Okay, this is I'm saying like the stars that ejected from the central Milky because we know a lot of fast stars moving in the center of our Milky Way that we already know some of them are even faster than this one, but they are very super close to the the center of the Milky Way. Um, this one is not in the center of the Milky Way. It's already ejected out. It's moving away from Milky Way. And among all of the stars that are moving away from Milky Way, I would say this is the fastest. Assistant Professor Ting Li of the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your research. It's absolutely fascinating. Really appreciate it. Sure, I'm glad uh, for, um, for sharing all the great news here and uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you.